Glimsels to Platforms, Episode 4. In this episode, Vale Fashion Rebel Alexander McQueen. Doing it David Bowie style. Vale costumes then and now. And the evolution of the bikini. It was a sad day when the fashion world lost Lee McQueen, the founder of British fashion label Alexander McQueen. He was a theatrical fashion rebel. In terms of tailoring, he was one of the best, but in terms of concept and style, he was derisive. You never quite knew what you were going to experience as a model or an audience member at an Alexander McQueen runway collection. Kate Moss is a life-sized Ripley hologram. A shipwreck? How about a chess game using models? Hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. You're in for a ride McQueen style. It was McQueen's early work with the theatrical and cinematic costumiers Angels and Bermans that fine-tuned his sense of drama. This company has been providing costumes to top productions since the 1800s. It's big business and they take it very seriously, as did their young apprentice, McQueen. He'd already done the hard yards in tailoring at Anderson and Shepherd on Savile Row. He'd garnered a reputation for fine detail. As with many great visual artists, once he'd mastered the traditional skills of his medium, McQueen was free to take flight and let his imagination run wild. And run wild, it did. There was often a sculptural element to McQueen's designs. Fabric defied the laws of physics under his touch. Yet you could always imagine yourself walking down the street in one of his dresses. As many stars such as Nicole Kidman, Sarah Jessica Parker and Lady Gaga have done. In 1996, McQueen became locked into a contract with Givenchy. It was an unhappy union on both sides. Givenchy felt slighted and disrespected by this outspoken l'enfant terrible, and McQueen felt creatively restrained by the fashion house. But he honoured the contract until his release in 2001, and rose like a phoenix from the ashes. He's, he's great at what he does. He's, he's, a, he's a genius, and he... His creative mind is just... I, I'm really truly at a loss for words. I've loved him for a very long time. The very first show I went to ever, fashion show, over 10 years ago was his in London, and that's where we first met. And he's always, he's been one of my favorites ever since. And he, he's just amazing. He really is. Even though McQueen's catwalk creations have included the fantastical, such as birds diving into parachute dresses, and models being spray painted by car robots, or rained on, literally, here is a designer who has given the world some day-to-day -day fashion staples. If it wasn't for Lee McQueen, we'd never have embraced the low-rise jean, or the bumpster, as he so irreverently termed it. Every young woman's wardrobe boasts a pair of bumpsters. And the skull motif epidemic that has hit handbags and scarves from London to Sydney? Alexander McQueen. Gucci know a bankable star when they see one. They took over Alexander McQueen label, injecting more capital into the business, allowing Lee to expand his stores to LA, Milan and New York. The LA store on Melrose Avenue is a whopping great 3,100 square feet that someone noted was filled with 70% air. But the product looks great and the stars turned out for the opening. He is amazing. I mean, this is a McQueen dress, it's, but it's still funky. I still feel comfortable in it. I can eat in it. That's a very big thing for me. McQueen didn't care much for celebrities. He even said no to Posh Spice, but they sure love him. I know, and I haven't seen the store yet. It looks amazing from the street. Um, but yeah, it's good. It was always fun to go to New York, and it'd be kind of special to go to Alexander McQueen, but uh, I'll get used to having it down the street. Lee McQueen had it all. He'd dressed everyone from Prince Charles to Rihanna. He'd been awarded British Designer of the Year four times from 96 to 2003. He'd been named the Council of Fashion Designers of America's International Designer of the Year 2003. Everything he turned his hand to took off. His shoes were selling like hotcakes. His fragrances Kingdom and My Queen hit the bestsellers list. But perhaps his star burned too brightly too quickly. On February 11th, 2010, eight days after the death of his mother, 
Lee McQueen was found dead in the wardrobe of his Green Street London residence. Friends and family believe he died of a broken heart. Valet Lee Alexander McQueen. Um, it's really about the moment. I think uh, what's going on politically in the world. Sometimes, sometimes the world is quite dark, and sometimes it's quite upbeat. Uh, it's very biographical at the time. Is in my personal life or people that surround me, and uh, and I and I and I think. Uh, that's good. Uh, I think uh, uh, some people call me an artist, uh, but you know, I don't see it as art, I just see it as a way of life. These revealing one piece bathing suits created a bit of a splash when they first appeared in 1915. Prior to this, turn of the century women had covered up from neck to toe. But did you know skimpy swimwear has been around since the 4th century? Roman gymnasts wore skimpy rectangular strips of material across their breasts and underpant-like bottoms, according to mosaics of the period. Early two-piece bathing suits like these appeared in the 1940s. Every care was taken to ensure belly buttons, hips and derrieres were well covered. Ava Gardner and Rita Hayworth posed pin-up style in two pieces, fueling the trend. In 1946, Louis Riard's bikini exploded onto the market, Named after the atomic bomb tests that had taken place in the Bikini Atoll a few days earlier, Riyadh's bikini was on fire. It was a scandal. No model was prepared to flash her belly button, so he had to hire strippers. Necklines were dangerously low. Gone was the safety of the structured halter neck. The USA rejected the trend, saying that French women needed higher cut swimsuits because they had shorter legs. So American girls continued wearing conservative two-piece bathing suits in films and on the beaches. European girls, however, took to bikinis like ducks to water. Fast forward half a century and it's hard to see what all the fuss is about. Everyone has a bikini. Not all of us look as fabulous as Elle McPherson in one, but there are cuts and styles to suit all shapes and sizes. I think everyone's got a one piece, but it's more for racing up and down a swimming pool. It's more practical, whereas a bikini is more to tan yourself and to show off your assets. In 1907, Australian silent film star Annette Kellerman was charged by American authorities for bearing her legs and shoulders whilst taking a dip. It caused such a ruckus in the media that the swimming apparel laws were subsequently changed. Now, it's possible to saunter down the catwalk wearing not much at all, with the latest haute couture designed ultra-revealing pieces. It's hard to believe women used to hire a horse and cart to wheel them from the top of the beach to the ocean where they would pop unseen into the waves, covered from neck to toe in billowing clothes. Things are at least a little more practical nowadays. And a whole lot more comfortable too. The first one-piece swimsuits designed for women around 1915 were made from knitted wool. Nowadays, of course, we have stretchy things like Laztex and Lycra. And the less of it, it seems, the better. It's true that American women steered clear of the bikini when it first came out. It wasn't until about a decade later when Brian Highland cheerfully sang she wore an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini that teens went wild at the stores. And suddenly bikinis were everywhere, even if mum and dad didn't quite approve. Bridget Bardot, Raquel Welsh and others first graced the screen in bikinis in movies like How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, One Million Years BC and Dr. No. The first issue of Sports Illustrated came out with a woman in a white bikini on the front. The bikini was becoming a huge success. Which is quite a feat for something that seems to be getting smaller and smaller with each season. Well, I think the bikini's got as small as it can ever get and still be called an article of clothing. I mean, it really was so tiny by the end. And even on Chanel's catwalks for this summer, the bikini top was the size of two small bottle tops. That's all um, he showed for his bikini top. The bikini's impact on the female figure can't be underestimated. In early bikini shots, figures were voluptuous, with tummies. By the 70s, a new creature had appeared in the media, the swimsuit model. These fine femmes had a more athletic build. That is to say, no stomach and not an inch of fat. I don't know what it's like to look at from a man's point of view, but I would imagine it's great because, you know, there's more on display and if it's on a good body, it's, it's fantastic. For women, it's a pleasure if you've got a good body, but for most women, it is, it's a nightmare. You don't have to be a supermodel to wear a bikini. Ask Sasha Baron Cohen.
Still seen as the epitome of grace, ballet would be a completely different art form if it wasn't for developments in costume. Ballet is one of the most visually spectacular of all dancers. The poise of each dancer, designed to look as though they were floating on air, is helped by beautiful feminine costuming that allows the audience to see each elegant jeté or pirouette. If it wasn't for flexible, breathable fabric design, we wouldn't have the graceful movements that define ballet today. Even rehearsal gear has had to become more free-flowing to allow dancers to practice free from constraint. Ballet costumes originally involved layers and layers of heavy fabric that weighed dancers down, restraining their movement. Gradually, skirt lengths began to rise, and in 1832, Italian choreographer Filippo Taglioni made history by dressing his ballerina daughter in a skirt, which would evolve to become the tutu and a sleeveless top, forming the basis for the type of costume we see today. By basing modern-day costumes on the type of clothing we might see down the street, or at least at the gym, ballet has become more accessible to a broader audience. No longer put off by the notion that ballet dancers are stuffy and uptight, freer, contemporary costuming has allowed ballet dancers to simply show off their skills and let individual personalities shine through. I think people have this image of dancers as being, especially the female dancers, as being sort of like these virgins that, you know, sort of like, you know, go home and sew point shoes all night in, you know, pink satin lined rooms. And I, I just think it's, it's so distant from what our girls are really like. And not only are freeform outfits bringing ballet to more people, they are allowing for more sensuality. Dance is a very sexy thing, you know. You see a whole lot of people in a rehearsal room together, you know, clad in lycra and sweating all over each other. It's pretty sexy. Regardless of the sweat factor, dance has always been an enchanting thing to watch. Today's dancers have the luxury of being able to wear costumes that might reflect a certain time period or character, but that are made of lightweight, breathable fabrics. During the 20th century, even after minor evolutions in dancewear, the restrictions surrounding the materials available still made life difficult, even for the most accomplished dancers. This dress was designed by Leon Baxt for Anna Pavlova in a role created for her by Fokine, that of the Dying Swan. And it's a performance costume, so essentially it was made to be worn, danced in, and then when it wore out, it would be replaced. So Pavlova had several of these costumes during her lifetime, but this is the final one that she wore um, when she was touring, just before she died. The dress is very different to today's ballet costume. The bodice is made of a stiffened silk, and that's boned, so obviously very uncomfortable to dance in. Um, and also it has quite cumbersome wings on the front of it and today costume is a lot more flexible and moves with the dancer a lot more easily. Luckily for the public, inventions in fabric design have allowed this art form to develop into what we know today. If it wasn't for the invention of nylon, we might not have tights or clothing that can hug the body as well as stretch. And dancers might not be able to do this. Sophia Loren wasn't always the smouldering screen siren the world knows her as. Sophia Villani Shigalone was called toothpick and stick by her friends at school. Hard to imagine, but the lady herself thought she looked like a giraffe when she was young, all gangly, tall and out of place. Unbelievably, Lorenz's looks were not an immediate hit with the public. She didn't win her first beauty contest. Fame was something she had to strive for. But when it arrived, 
It was monumental. Sofia Lozzaro was the name she chose for the beginning of her career. She stole the eye of Italian lawyer and filmmaker Carlo Ponti, who judged her in a beauty contest. It was Carlo who pushed her to castings in small Italian films. By 1952, a friend of Ponti's had encouraged the young actress to change her name to Sofia Loren, the name we all have come to associate with sultry style and smouldering good looks. Here, Loren looks ravishing in what was probably a Christian Dior gown. It has those Dior-inspired Belle Epoque features, showing off Loren's cinched waist and hourglass figure to perfection. Dior went on to design clothes for Loren in films such as Arabesque. It's a stylish woman who can look a million dollars a couple of hours after childbirth. Arguably, Loren at her prettiest. To protect her stunning cat-like eyes, Sophia opted for Dior's large sunglasses, so iconic of the 1970s. During her illustrious career, Loren won a swathe of awards. The first came for the Italian film Two Women, which saw her play a mother in war-torn Europe, something she could relate to, having survived bombings in the Second World War. She went on to win another Oscar, five Golden Globes, a BAFTA and a Grammy for her music. The older Sophia became, the more comfortable she was with her sensuality. A woman's dress should be like a barbed wire fence, she says, serving its purpose without obstructing the view. Now in her seventh decade, Loren has proven to be one of those rare stars who chooses to age gracefully. Her day-to-day -day dress may have toned down in style, but this lady can still glam it up. Recently, she was inducted into the Italian-American Hall of Fame, looking absolutely stunning in diamonds and a low-cut dress. Everything you see I owe to spaghetti, says Loren of her full healthy figure. And she believes sex appeal is not something you can attribute to physical traits like breasts or thighs or the pout of one's lips. It comes from within. You either have it or you don't. Lucky for Sophia, she has it in spades. She is the first native of Italy to be inducted into the National Italian American Foundation's Hall of Fame. My loving dear friend, Sophia Loren, the incomparable Sophia. receive this special recognition from you and from the National Italian American Foundation. May we continue to cherish all the God has given us. Thank you so much for this wonderful ovation. Thank you really from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Can't wait to bring our show to you, whatever that show is. It'll be fun, all right? See you there. Changes, the many faces of David Bowie over the years have kept us all entertained and wanting more. The master costume chameleon has given us everything from glam rock to the thin white duke. Whether he looks like he's just rolled out of bed or has spent hours at the salon getting primped, Dave's leggy insouciance is a crowd pleaser. He even dressed to compliment his medal when he was made commander of the British Empire in 2000. Bowie has an innate sense of style. Suits are a recurring theme in the Bowie wardrobe, particularly white ones. The thin white Duke persona sported them in the 70s. Then they reappeared in the 80s, albeit with thinner lapels. But definitely the white suit is a Bowie mainstay. Coupled with braces, loafers and slicked back hair, it's that classic Bowie mix of style and comfort. Don't know about showing off the ankles and going without socks though, that's a bit eccentric. David has worn his hair blonde, brown, even bright red as the androgynous Ziggy Stardust. Bowie is a painter and sculptor as well as a musician. This is a, um, a musician in recess. Uh, I think it's a, a musician in the playroom. I collect art, I know art very well. I know the worth of my stuff and I don't need to be told. What is the worth of your stuff? That's for me to know. <laughs> That's for me to know and uh, others to purchase. Oh, definitely, yeah, a man with many talents, David Bowie. I mean, we, we are not worthy, what can I say? 
It's not surprising Dave is an accomplished painter and sculptor. He has throughout his music career conceptualized himself and his persona as visual art almost. Bowie style comes from deep within. Tap into it if you dare. It's rather disturbing because when you're young you think so much is important, including oneself. <laughs> but as you get older I think you, you find less and less is important, apart from some very fundamental things. Uh, one of them being a love of one's fellow man and uh, a care for their survival and a care for one's immediate family, then friends, and then wider like a circle, like ripples in, a, in, in water. In the future, it will be possible to create a stunning impact on the catwalk minus the negative impact on the planet. Millions of tons of clothing nobody wants ends up as landfill. The cost in terms of wasted energy and unhealthy pollution is hefty. Professor Helen Storey from the London College of Fashion and Professor Tony Ryan from Sheffield Uni have their hearts set on changing all that. I think it's born out of a frustration with my own industry. Um, it goes against the grain of things, but for me, beauty isn't enough anymore. Um, and I seem to be very attracted to the notion of, of uh, things that are beautiful having purpose. And in that sense, if something's going to have a purpose, the things I tend to respond to most are things that I perceive the world requires. If Helen and Tony have their way, after you get sick of wearing a piece of clothing, you'll be able to dissolve it and feed it to your garden. When you place the fabric in water, some of the matrix washes away, but the remaining gel is biodegradable and good for plants. This new material could revolutionise the packaging industry as well. To demonstrate their concept, Helen and Tony recently held a fashion exhibition of sorts. They suspended several haute couture dresses made from soluble material over gigantic fish bowls of water. The dresses were slowly lowered as the crowd oohed and aahed over the pretty colours swirling about in the water. The pair wanted to demonstrate the impermanence of fashion. What's pretty one season is gone the next. Now we have the opportunity to control where it actually goes. Right, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a classically trained scientist, I'm a chemistry professor, so I kind of I work in, in, in boundaries. And, you know, you test those boundaries out, but you never go a long way from, from, you never go a long way from the boundary. Right, so when someone says to you, um, if two atoms can have a conversation across the universe, right, a process that's called quantum entanglement, that I know about, why can't a bottle have a conversation with its contents? Right, well, well, those two things are completely unrelated. Quantum entanglement's theoretical, and you know, washing up bottles and the liquid that's in them are very real. So I would never conflate those two ideas. There's so much wrong in the world, I don't feel it's possible just to churn out stuff for the sake of churning out stuff, because I think blue is important this season. Fashion never looked greener. 